Most choices are based on guesswork because most individuals need a technique for reaching them. It is logical. Then again, we're frequently advised to follow our instincts or utilize a resource, such as the well-liked pros and disadvantages list, to make decisions. But the study suggests something else, we earn a bunch of choices every day, therefore it's critical to comprehend why we come to the options we do. These sections aid in reducing the sense of magic that permeates the field of judgment. They provide helpful advice on how to strengthen our decision-making process so that we may keep learning from our mistakes and make better decisions going forward. The following sections will teach you the distinction among judgments with low and substantial effect, how to evaluate your decision-making procedure, and the advantages of general relativity. Chapter 1. We make the error of assessing the effectiveness of a choice by its outcome. Consider starting a new career where everything is perfect, wonderful co-workers a fulfilling job, within a year, and, you receive a substantial raise, now think about a comparable circumstance. You take a new position, but the results are completely the opposite, unfulfilling work, unwelcoming co-workers, and, on top of it all, you're fired. You no longer have a job a year from now, which job change was a wise move? The first, correct? And besides, you were able to collaborate on interesting projects, made more money, and avoided being dismissed. Now let us stop there since you might have observed that this evaluation is fully dependent on the result of the decision. It doesn't tell much about the choice itself, we frequently overlook the steps taken to arrive at a choice. Typically, we can recall the outcome. Nevertheless, concentrating only on the outcomes may result in an erroneous evaluation of the statement's value. It's termed resulting to use the outcome to gauge how well a choice was. It is often referred to as outcome bias in psychology. Although it may seem logical, this cognitive link ultimately deceives us into overvaluing the part that luck played in the result while undervaluing the role that a choice performed, there are numerous potential outcomes for every choice. These results could be beautiful, hideous, or a combination of both. But whatever it is, Looking back, we have a different understanding of how that result was reached. Since we are not at all evaluating the judgment processes, this results in making the same blunders or wrong choices. We are only considering the result. Would a good result indicate that you chose the right choice, for instance, if you cross a road at a red light? Not, the results have an impact on how we perceive the world. Kindness for both oneself and others may be jeopardized. We might conclude that somebody's bad luck was brought on by a poor choice. If things do not go as we had hoped. We can criticize ourselves, even if some circumstances are out of our control, the whole first approach to making informed choices, irrespective of favorable or unfavorable results, is to stop relying on results. Chapter 2 in many cases, retrospective prejudice alters how we perceive a choice, leading us to embrace a particular result as unavoidable, that was destined to occur, I knew it. They lost. I didn't realize I missed it previously because it is so obvious. Did you ever say anything comparable to yourself? Or a colleague has a special aptitude for turning out to be right after a choice is made. Once we are acutely aware of the outcome, it is simple to update our understanding of the latest happenings. We become omnipotent in the past. Or we believe that someone else possesses a cunning capacity to accurately anticipate destiny. But everything here is false. Completely mistaken the details after the conclusion only complicates whenever it comes to gaining knowledge from our choices, judgmental discrimination takes place when we persuade ourselves that a result was clear or foreseeable. This also referred to as encroaching inevitability, has an impact on how we perceive our personal and other people's past choices. We begin with the consequence and go backward from there to a modified memory of what we were conscious of when the choice was taken, undoubtedly, there are things we can't predict, it's challenging to comprehend all, particularly because we're attempting to make a choice. By incorporating the additional information we learned after knowing the outcome, hindsight bias affects our recall of the event. What ought to be done with this fresh knowledge? 
we create a story that makes this particular result inevitable and renders all other outcomes impractical. Although we are unable to instantly banish retrospective prejudice, we could employ a straightforward tool named an information monitor to lessen its effect on decisions made in the future. This is how it functions. Make a note of the facts and convictions that influenced your judgment before you make a decision. This contains pertinent information as well as supporting evidence. Make a note of each of the additional facts you learned after making your decision, such as what you know now that the conclusion has been determined. We could identify what data was overlooked and what percentage of the consequence was attributable to our executive proposal by contrasting this ending quest knowing. After performing this for options and choices, we'll gain an understanding of the typical indications and effects of personal prejudices. Chapter 3, when you do not collect enough information about your choices, you didn't master those. If must, and possibly if you're like most individuals, you've probably experienced periods of magical thinking or even regret as a result of your decisions. If only circumstances had gone another way. I wish my meeting had not even taken place earlier in the day. If only I had come first before the raspberry waffles were all gone, to be honest, the past cannot be changed. It's over when it's finished. But to better ourselves as decision-makers and to comprehend how much we've made judgments in the past, we must look back. Furthermore, we cannot declare one result to be the sole unavoidable option. Alternatively, we must look at numerous choices and numerous outcomes. To conclude from our person's perspective, we have to gather data from a variety of decisions. Although in fact for our choices to offer helpful feedback, it's crucial to contrast them to similar education and possible consequences, whether they be actual or hypothetical, consider it in statistical terms. Would you believe the research that excluded other pizza joints yet declared Joe's Pizza to be the finest in the world? Count on our word alone. The finest is at Jimmy's. The same applies to assessing our choices. I suppose. We only have a confidence interval of one if we think of a choice as a unique phenomenon with a single fixed result. There is just one case to draw lessons from, and the reliability of our information is constrained. Performing the same actions repeatedly will help us build up our data so that we have the necessary amount for data methods. However, the majority of us do not have the capacity. We can thus utilize our minds to generate additional what-if situations to gather more information. Unfalsifiable thought, as it is called in neuroscience, involves picturing imaginary, prospective possibilities. It's a useful method to learn from our mistakes and a useful approach to contrast potential results with the result you got. For instance, when applying for employment, we can go back to the handful of questions we've previously had and contrast the results with those of hypothetical ones. What inquiries will be challenging to respond to? Are there any topics we like to keep from the reporter talking about? Chapter 4, The Five Strategy Aids in Minimizing Influence and Enhancing Decision Making, you just return to your Florida home by the water to discover an offer letter in your mailbox. It's your ideal position at a business you ever imagined working for. The location is in Harvard, Virginia, therefore there is a catch. The only problem was that you detest the cold and have spent the majority of your middle adulthood doing your best to prevent the climate in Great Britain, will you depart for Massachusetts or will you stay in Florida? Being forced to make such a significant life commitment may feel cruel, but by dividing it into six doable stages, you may choose the option that properly reflects your beliefs, choose a concern initially. Then create a reasonable list of alternative outcomes. Taken into account first, accept the position. You might discover that you don't mind winter, for example. Or perhaps you come to the realization that while you adore Massachusetts, the work is not for you. Or you insist that the cold renders it intolerable. All of these scenarios are conceivable. Those within elevated occupations, such as accountants and lawyers, have decided on quantitative alternatives for some statements since words are ambiguous. When providing tax guidance, can be, refers to a level of confidence between 91 and 97 percent, but, less likely, only refers to a level of certainty above 50 percent. A suitable basis is 24 to 40, recklessness and a lack of knowledge affect a lot of decisions negatively. And whether or not a choice is something that on how you display your data.
If you aim to project confidence irrespective of your degree of confidence and if you don't want to learn anything new, adhere to those linguistic expressions that are simple to misunderstand. On the other side, it is preferable to represent ambiguity as a quantitative scale if your objective is to elicit useful feedback and recognize informational gaps. When others sense ambiguity, they are more willing to provide valuable knowledge, but they are more inclined to do so when you appear to be assured. A technique known as a shocking assessment is used to define higher and lower bounds to create a quantitative spectrum of confidence. After deciding on the limitations, consider whether you'd be surprised if the result fell beyond this range. The spectrum needs to be both tight enough to be useful and large enough to make anything outside of it absolutely shocking. Chapter 6, a combination of the exterior and inner views creates an appropriate perception. Consider a friend who is perpetually late. He consistently encounters congestion at a bad times. He is constantly bothered at red lights by irritable slow drivers. He views everything as constantly being unfortunate. However, from your vantage point, he has more influence on the situation than he realizes. Would this imply that you are fully informed while he is not? No. It's simpler to spot the characteristics he's lacking from a distance. You'll need to sharpen your structure abilities if you want to make sure you're not that pal. Getting acquainted with two viewpoints, the external view and the interior view, is one method to do this, our viewpoints, instincts, and ideas shape how we see the environment from the inside. This is the view of the world that we have. You might be able to predict that it all from outside our viewpoint makes up the outer view. In other terms, it's how other people operate, or our circumstances. Picking apart somebody else's shortcomings is much simpler than facing our own. Personality and belief are intricately interwoven. Because doing so might damage our sense of identity, we often refrain from challenging our views. We regularly deceive ourselves without even realizing it, failing to see that truth lies anywhere between our viewpoints and other people, so what is a simple method to obtain the outside perspective? Viewpoint monitoring is a useful tool for balancing the contrasts between inner and outside perspectives. Just like information monitoring was in the previous section. This is the procedure, imagine that you are thinking about changing careers. Although you have a background in sales, you were always unsure about switching to advertising. Sketch two lines. In the first, referred to as the external view, you should explain your choice using factual evidence and how outsiders see your circumstance. What advice would you give a teammate facing the same problem? While people attempt to transition from sales to customer service. What is generally true? Explain the same circumstance from your perspective, the inside view, in the left graph. Then, search for duplication and irregularities. What features do the two points of view share? What has changed? Make notes of your observations. Recognizing the junction between the exterior and interior views affected your viewpoint on the circumstance, did it not? If not, then why? You'll keep a more accurate count of the data used to make the selection once you understand the result. Chapter 7, Finding Regular. Moderate options allows for more space to be spent on rare, elevated options, 150 minutes. The average individual takes that long every week to decide which one to consume, choosing what else to dress takes between 90 and 120 minutes each week and each week, choosing which one to view on YouTube takes 1.5 hours, that amounts to 260 to 285 hours total each year spent on routine, somewhat unimportant judgments. This is primarily due to performance anxiety, in which having too many options results in a needlessly time-consuming judgment call. So how might we make better use of our decision-making time? Priorities first use a satisfaction test that you perform on yourself to evaluate whether a choice will have a serious influence on your satisfaction one year from now. Proceed with the five-step procedure indicated in Chapter 4 if the response is affirmative. If the response is, no, you should decide more quickly. Repeated judgments have the benefit that they recur, despite the possibility of momentary remorse, which also takes time. The same choice can be made repeatedly while considering various alternatives and results. Examples of recurring options include picking which movie to view, taking a distinct path to work, or placing multiple versions from the same table. 
Several of these minimal choices are considered free because they have few downsides but many possible rewards. If the situation doesn't work out, you won't be losing anything and won't suffer any consequences. Through option layering, you can learn more about what succeeds and what does not the more choices you take. Try several activities that are simple to give up as this is one method of choice stacking. For instance, you might go on numerous dates before beginning a committed relationship. Knowing what you enjoy and dislike can help you to better understand what you want in a committed partnership. Joining classes is another option. Music lessons are not as severe as some guitar teachers develop them to be, there seems to be a lot to be learned from passing judgment again, and the knowledge gained through taking many hard choices can also help with delayed, elevated choices in the future. Since most judgments are formed with limited knowledge, a portion of the process entails making an accurate prediction. Seeing what occurs, and using the experience to shape future predictions, Chapter 8, carefully recognizing possible roadblocks will assist you to steer clear of them entirely, keep your eyes closed and picture the future version of yourself. It's a beautiful picture. You are prosperous. You're joyful. You've accomplished your most difficult objectives, keep your eyes open immediately. Did it succeed? Do you exist? Has any of that been altered? The positive thoughts movement has enjoyed a successful reign. End up dying optimists have long argued that we can more quickly discover achievement if we can visualize it, however, recent research has begun to show that the contrary is more accurate. It comes out that thinking negatively produces results instead of thinking positively. Mental comparison is the process through which we conjure up potential explanations for failure. For almost 25 years, Boston University social psychologist Deborah Gabby has studied how expectation affects results. She has been paying close attention to the impact that both favorable and unfavorable thoughts have on achieving goals. In research on weight loss, individuals who saw themselves struggling to attain their goal of losing more than 50 pounds dropped a mean of 25 kilograms more compared to those who believed they would succeed. These results were supported by Gabby in several other contexts, including post-operative recovery durations and academic performance. The study found that even while it is uncomfortable to think about failure in the meantime, doing so enhances the probability of accomplishing a goal, building on the fundamental notion of psychological comparison, we may also employ cognitive travel to picture ourselves in ancient times or beyond, depending on our choice. Place the time engine to 12 weeks from now. Just long enough for your experimentation with music instruction to begin. You can examine the fictional event that uses this cognitive travel and consider why it was successful or unsuccessful, this is referred to as future retrospect. You can utilize the knowledge you obtained from this activity to help you overcome the foreseeable difficulties, you have another period device at your fingertips, which psychiatrist Alan Klein refers to as a pre -modem. This necessitates coming up with reasons why a given aim will collapse before when it starts. Retrospective enables you to avoid predicted difficulties the whole first moment. Companies regularly conduct retrospectives to prevent repeating the same errors in upcoming projects. Chapter 9, Don't share your perspective before asking for criticism if you desire an accurate reply, until you can respond when a person asks if you enjoy Charlie Trotter movies, she says, I absolutely cannot stand them. Such a bore. Anyone else who enjoys them must also be uninteresting, you would probably nod in agreement if you didn't have a strong view of Chaplin's work. What about if, though, you were a major Charlie fan? Your walls are covered with a large Contemporary Times painting. And your bookshelves are stacked with Charles Trotter memorabilia. Your love of comedy silent movies may outweigh your dislike of confrontation. But if you were like many individuals, you'd at least make an effort to downplay your interest to be somewhat less in conflict with your friend's critical assessment, what more might your buddy have tried to elicit an open reaction from you, the likelihood that your perspective will be repeated to you in a few infinite amounts whenever you approach anybody for their viewpoint but first express your position. This could be done out of politeness, a need to avoid conflict or fear of looking foolish. Don't reveal the result if you wish to discover what another person would have done in your shoes using the same facts. They only want the information you had at the time of your decision, the authors attributed this to keeping your views to yourself to prevent spreading them to others. The cognitive component, 
also known as cognitive bias, happens when the sequence in which data is presented affects how we, the receiver, perceive it. So, when we wish to hear different opinions on the same subject in a group environment, how else do we stop falling into this snare? For just one, invisibility is particularly useful. You might consult with each teammate privately before disclosing the findings throughout a conference if you are in charge of a management board that's debating if to purchase a specific business. Additionally, you get the chance to hear everyone else's distinctive viewpoints, including those of people who are reluctant to express their opinions in front of others. As an alternative, you may encourage individuals to record their ideas before reading them publicly, starting with the teammates who are the least experienced it's simple to miss the minor details that can prevent you from receiving honest criticism. We can guarantee that user feedback is received if we take conscious steps to avoid confusing effects such as the notable effects, how to decide, simple tools for making better choices by Annie Duke book review, every issue, no matter how big or small. Needs to be carefully considered, but our methods are frequently uneven. This hinders the ability to learn from the mistakes and accomplishments of the past. When the result of a judgment is apparent, we frequently can't recall precisely what we understood or believed at the time of the choice. We can't properly measure what did smoothly and what did not without having a thorough knowledge of all that. We can learn invaluable principles to guide future actions by discussing probability in detail, soliciting impartial criticism, and following our understanding from the choice to the result. We may close the discrepancy between such a chance forecast and an honest assessment if we are open to the amount we do not really understand and then attempt to fill in the gaps. Using only one entry, more options mean more issues. When there are too many options, it makes us more anxious and causes us to spend excessive amounts of time in a frustrating condition of performance anxiety. Utilizing whose only check is one method to overcome this, consider this question the next moment you're neck deep in YouTube options and unable to make a choice could I be okay with this video if it were the sole one obtainable? Consider this question while you are in a cafe looking at the menus for the third season, could I be satisfied eating the roasted chicken if the roasted halibut were not available on the plate, we could avoid dithering and continue to the next step by condensing countless alternatives into a specific comment.